I call the National Assembly to order. And the first item on our agenda this afternoon is questions to the First Minister. And the first question is from Paul Davis. Will the First Minister make a statement what the Welsh Government is doing to support small businesses in West Wales? Well, business support is available for entrepreneurs, micro, small and medium-sized businesses across Wales through our Business Wales service. Our focus remains on supporting innovation-driven entrepreneurs, jobs and the economy. First Minister, I continue to receive comments from constituents, constituents and businesses in West Wales complaining about business rates. Although your government announced additional funding for high street businesses, there is a great deal of confusion and many businesses don't know who's qualified to receive that assistance. So can you confirm that the government will be far clearer as to who qualifies? And also, can you tell us why the government wanted to target high street business without including other businesses? Well, of course, what we've been trying to do is helping those who've lost out temporarily because of the renewal of the business rates. Many people have benefited from that. And of course, those businesses who are keeping quiet perhaps have seen a drop in the business rates. But we hope that we'll be able to help small businesses, particularly those who've seen an increase in their rates. Figures from Lloyds Bank have shown that 40% fewer businesses were established in the last five years in Pembrokeshire, Gwynedd, Ceredigion and Anglesey as compared with the fall of 26% across Wales and 20% in England. Is the First Minister willing to look into the, why the figures are so very different in the westerly counties as compared with places such as Blaenau Gwent, where there's been a decline of only 8%, and the, the award goes to Merthyr, where fewer than half a percent decline was seen. And would the First Minister ask his ministers to look at this issue on what's happening in West Wales or in this particular area? Well, I believe you're talking about the Lloyds Bank figures. We don't know what methodology they used and we don't know exactly what the nature of the data set is. Having said that, the number of business births have increased by 8,225 in 2011 to 11,025 in 2015. But, of course, we will consider the figures that have been issued by Lloyds Bank to see whether there's any kind of a problem here that we need to address in one part of Wales. The uh, Welsh Government announced two new business investment funds of £7 million uh, each. Uh, the application deadline is in, is in just five weeks' time. The same thing happened uh, with the Growth and Prosperity Fund uh, last year, announced on September the six, uh, uh, 17th, uh, last year, the deadline for the large applications was just four weeks later. The Scottish Government create, has created a £500 million fund with an open window for applications over three years. We seem to run the show with, with every time the, the, the Welsh Government finds a bit of money uh, down the back of uh, you know, uh, Wefo's sofa, they announce a new fund and it's closed before most businesses have had the opportunity to hear about it. It's the opposite of strategic and I would say to the First Minister gen gently, it makes Wales look amateurish. Well, uh, our unemployment rate is better than Scotland, uh, actually. Our economic uh, uh, growth is better than Scotland. We have done far better than the Scottish Government in that regard. Can I also say that the uh, schemes that he has referred to were oversubscribed. It may be that the window is short, but nevertheless, the schemes are popular, they deliver, and their economic statistics show that. Question, die, Je Question two, Jeremy Miles. What is the Welsh Government doing to tackle rough sleeping in Wales? Rough sleeping, we know, is a problem in uh, many parts of uh, Wales, which is why, of course, we have the legislation uh, that we passed in order to ensure that uh, rough sleeping was uh, dealt with. Uh, there is a question mark, of course, uh, at the moment in terms of us being able to understand uh, the numbers of people who are sleeping rough. It can be a difficult figure to, uh, to assess, uh, but we're not complacent, complacent and we're continuing to invest through our Supporting People programme and Homelessness Prevention Grants. I thank the First Minister for that response. Last week, uh, press reports highlighted the experience of people sleeping rough in Neath. 
The people who were interviewed had been through job loss, difficulty in claiming benefits, prison and addiction. And they spoke movingly about the impact on their health and their sense of loneliness. The legislation the First Minister has referred to is acknowledged as having made great progress, in particular around prevention, and I welcome supporting people's preservation, as he mentioned in his response. But Shelter believes the way the Welsh Government monitors rough sleeping means, in their words, that we simply don't know enough about rough sleeping to be able to fix it. And they also highlight the comparative lack of housing first accommodation in Wales. In addition to the measures already in place, will the First Minister therefore look at how the Welsh Government monitors rough sleeping so we can understand, it, uh, understand how best to tackle it? And will he also look at the availability of housing first stock in Wales? Yes, uh, an independent evaluation of the implementation of the Housing Wales Act 2014 has been commissioned and an interim report is expected in draft format by June of this year. And that work will help us to understand how rough sleepers are being treated under the legislation. And I can say that alternative monitoring systems are being explored in order to uh, assist with the annual monitoring that uh, takes place. And uh, there will be further information on that later in the, the year. And of course, we're looking to work with local authorities who are responsible for needing, meeting needs in their local areas uh, to ensure that uh, the issue, that people don't become homeless in the first place, which of course is the intention of the legislation. Bethan Jenkins. First Minister, as has already been mentioned, Shelter are gravely concerned with the lack of data available to monitor what is happening in Wales. And I believe with many of your other programmes, such as Communities First and Communities at Work, that data and a lack of data is an emerging theme for your government. Now, with such an important issue and the fact that we do have such strong legislation, why does a situation arise where there is a lack of data on such an important issue? And what work, in addition to that that you've just outlined in your response to Jeremy Miles, will be ongoing in order to ensure that there is no growth next year in the number of homeless people in Wales? Well, one of the one datum which is important is that the statistics from 2015 to 2016 legislation was successful in helping 85 percent of families who felt under pressure were under pressure and perhaps lost their house because of that. And so we know that that has worked extremely well. But as I said earlier, it is extremely important to ensure that the data that we have is adequate in order to ensure that the legislation works in the most effective way possible. Well, as a member of the multi-agency and cross-party working group that um, successfully campaigned under the leadership of community campaigners TCC to establish the Tinos Night Shelter in Wrexham, it's particularly frustrating that the Welsh Government's latest national rough sleep account not only shows a 72% increase in rough sleepers across Wales, but the numbers in Wrexham on the night of the count up from 17 to 27 on the previous year, and at 61, Wrexham with the highest proportion of people sleeping rough over a two-week period in Wales, significantly higher even than Cardiff. How, therefore, do you propose that the Welsh Government should engage with Wrexham Town Centre Forum Steering Group, whose chair, uh, Andrew Atkinson, says it's time for everyone to put politics aside, stop blaming each other and work together neutrally to get to grips with the town's issues. The member for Conservative candidate, as we know, uh, who uh, may not be perhaps the most objective person to quote at this stage, but I have to say his party has to take responsibility for this. Many people become homeless because of the changes in welfare benefits, the hammering that people have had through the bedroom tax. Yes, it's true to say uh, that we look to use legislation and other means in order to look to prevent homelessness. But, of course, the UK government is responsible for taking money away from people and putting them in danger of being homeless. And so his party has to accept responsibility for much of the threat of homelessness uh, that people have to face. Caroline Jones. The is, uh, First Minister, unfortunately, um, the narrative around left, rough sleeping has been completely toxic. Um, rather than seeing rough sleepers as poor, unfortunate souls forced to find shelter in shop doorways, facing hypothermia and starvation, many have seen them and branded them as delinquents and a scourge to be removed from our high streets. First Minister, do you agree with me that rather than serving ASBOs on these people or locking them up for vagrancy, across, councils across Wales should be providing shelter and working with the various agencies and partnerships to find them permanent accommodation and support? Well, I'm not sure you can lock people up for vagrancy anymore, but I take the point about stigma. 
Uh, I have been to the Salvation Army's purple bus that, that appears in Ecotase Park in Cardiff. I've seen uh, many of the people and met many of the people who are, who are homeless. They have very, very different stories to tell. Some of them have to wrestle with addiction. Uh, some of them find it very difficult to remain in accommodation when they get that accommodation. And there are many problems that individuals have to, uh, to face. But through the work of groups like the Salvation Army, with the accommodation that they provide, working with local authorities and government, we aim to provide a holistic solution to the problems that so many people face that makes them homeless in the first place. Question in our Questions now from the party leaders, leader of the Welsh Conservatives, Andrew R.T. Davis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I first of all wish you many happy returns, First Minister? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. As someone who's got many years to go before I hit the milestone of uh, 50, uh, I look forward to maybe you telling me what it's like. <laughs> Um, but I wish you all the best on, on, on your birthday today. And I'd also like to send best wishes to the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, who obviously yeah. is convalescing at the moment, uh, and hopefully she'll be back with us as soon as possible. Uh, yesterday, First Minister, uh, the, Swans the, the Swansea City deal was signed by both governments, and obviously the, the partners who worked to build up that deal, the local authorities and businesses, importantly businesses, uh, who were involved in creating the combination of projects that hopefully will lift GVA and employability skills levels uh, and the prospects for the Swansea city region and I specifically mention region because it's not just Swansea we're looking at here um, there have though not unreasonably been put to people that this doesn't bear much of a resemblance to what Sir Terry Matthews uh, was talking about when he initially, as the, form, as the chair uh, of the City Region Board, uh, brought forward some 12 months ago, and the concept has moved away from people and more to buildings. Uh, do you share that view uh, and the view that actually the, the, the deal before us could potentially be a building for people to come rather than invest in the people in the region? No, I mean, the, the deal itself uh, is a deal that had to be agreed uh, via the local authorities and by UK government and with ourselves. Absolutely right to say it, that almost half of the investment that will come will come from the private sector. It's a very good example of what happens when governments cooperate. It's a very good example of what happens when public and private sector cooperate as well. The projects, the 11 projects that will be funded, are intended to create more than 10,000 jobs. So it's not about buildings, it is about creating uh, jobs and opportunities for people. And that is something that uh, both governments and the local authorities are confident will happen. And you are confident, First Minister, with this deal, that GVA, which is about 74% of the UK level in the Swansea City region, will increase over the 15 years of the deal. So can you give us some firm indicators that you will be benchmarking and your government will be benchmarking as success? What can we expect in the three, five, eight and ten years uh, that obviously this deal will be coming forward so that we can actually mark you and the UK government and the partners about the increase in GVA levels uh, in this area because it is vital that people actually can see wealth and opportunity increasing rather than some of the sound bites that we've had on other regeneration initiatives that maybe have happened in the past. There is an issue in Wales, as indeed is, there is in the UK, uh, about productivity. There's no easy silver bullet that deals with productivity, but one area where productivity can be improved is through skills, providing people uh, via those skills with higher paid jobs. Uh, the leader of the, the Welsh Conservatives asked how do we judge whether the scheme is successful? Two ways of measuring. First of all, an increase in GVA per head, and secondly, an increase in G GVA per head when compared to the rest of Wales and the rest of the UK. Both those things I expect to see delivered. I welcome that. I would have liked maybe a more definitive mark as to where you would like to see GVA over the period growing to uh, from where it is at the moment, at 74%. But it is important that Cardiff has got a city deal, Swansea has got a city deal, Swansea City Region has got a city deal. Obviously, North Wales uh, desperately needs the growth deal to be delivered. And yesterday, in The Guardian, you accused the Prime Minister of having a tenure when it came to uh, listening to concerns that you raised around devolution and maybe the constitutional fabric of the UK. One thing that has come out from North Wales, uh, from the Ambition Board in particular, is the ability for the Welsh Government to devolve responsibility to North Wales uh, so that those powers around business rates, for example, around skills and around transport, and I appreciate there are issues around business rates, but on skills and transport, there would be a greater synergy between the Northern Powerhouse and North Wales to create a better driver for economic prosperity in North Wales. Will your government actively consider 
devolving responsibilities out of Cattays Park, or will you be showing a tenure to the requests that are coming out of North Wales uh, from businesses and council leaders when they're asking you for these responsibilities? Well, uh, there's no difficulty with what the leader of the Welsh Conservatives is saying. The Cardiff City deal and the Swansea Bay deal are driven by local authorities. Uh, it's something that, something that we seek to impose. The same will apply to the North Wales uh, growth deal. Uh, I made the point yesterday, this is not about the south of Wales or indeed about, about large urban areas. Uh, these are the two deals that were, that were ready first because of the, the, the working between local authorities. The North East particularly would come next and we will look to uh, devolve as many powers as we can uh, in the future. In terms of business rates, it's more difficult because uh, with business rates we know that there are many local authorities who would lose out if business rates were devolved. But we want to make sure that as many decisions are taken locally as possible. That means local authorities being very much in the driving seat, working together to deliver for their regions and working cross-border, of course, with, uh, creating prosperity both sides of the border. Leader of the UKIP group, Neil Hamilton. Oh, I'd like to wish the First Minister a happy birthday as well and to assure him that as you get older, there's nothing to fear as long as you remain in rude health like me. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the First Minister will, will, will agree. <laughs> The first, the, first, the first Minister will agree, I'm sure, that whatever our differing views on Brexit, uh, uncertainty is, is to be deprecated, and uh, the Prime Minister at least is about to resolve one uncertainty by triggering um, Article 50. It's regrettable, though, I, uh, that uh, Nicola Sturgeon has now sought to create another uncertainty over a referendum in Scotland, uh, no doubt confident that the Prime Minister would refuse her request. Uh, I wonder if the First Minister would agree with me the best way to reduce this particular uncertainty is to call Nicola Sturgeon's bluff and hold a referendum. Well, first things first, I should uh, thank the Leader of UK and indeed the Leader of the Welsh Conservatives for their, for their, good, uh, their good wishes uh, from different perspectives, uh, indeed, of, uh, in, in that regard. But um, my view is, and I've said this publicly, that if the Scottish Parliament votes to hold a referendum, the UK Government should not stand in the way of the Scottish uh, Parliament any more than the European Commission of Parliament should have stood in the way of the UK holding a referendum on, uh, on, on Brexit. Uh, and I think it's right that if the Scottish Parliament supports uh, a referendum uh, and looks for a particular date, that the views of the Scottish Parliament should be respected. Well, I'm glad to, to hear the First Minister say that, because I, I agree with him. Um, that it is rarely wrong to consult the people on a major issue of this kind. And if there were to be a referendum campaign, uh, it would also have some relevance for Wales, because Scotland has a, a budget deficit of 15 billion a year, although it's a larger economy than Wales. Uh, it's much the same figure uh, as we have here, 15 billion deficit. Uh, and that is effectively a transfer of funds from one part of the UK to another, which would disappear if either Scotland or Wales became politically independent. Well, I, I, it is not my view that independence is in Wales's interests. Uh, I'm aware of the uh, substantial financial transfers that uh, take place, uh, uh, that come into Wales, which is why I'm a strong devolutionist, but uh, not somebody who supports independence. Um, and it's very important, I think, all of us who believe in the integrity of the United Kingdom should remain united on this point, that actually Wales would be vastly poorer if it left the United Kingdom, because there is no way that any cut in any budget by a UK department, which would be subsequently devolved to Wales, could possibly be compensated for in any other way. And therefore, because public expenditure is now nearly 60% of the Welsh GDP, there would be a massive hit for all poor and vulnerable people and all those who rely upon the National Health Service and other social services for their health and well-being. The, 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 the case for independence by those who make it in Wales is built not on the economy, to my mind, but on emotion. Uh, what we must guard against, from my perspective, is that the emotional case doesn't overwhelm the economic one, which is why it's hugely important that when the UK leaves the EU, that we have in place a structure that reflects a proper partnership of four nations within the UK, that it's not a case of the UK government imposing its will in devolved areas on the uh, devolved uh, governments, and we also have an independent adjudication process for policing the rules of the internal single market of the UK. I believe that's the way forward. Respect for the four national identities within the UK, as well as other identities within the, within the UK, and that, for me, uh, would represent for Wales uh, a very good outcome. But my worry is 
The UK government, I mentioned, I did say that the, the 10 year, although the meeting yesterday was better, I have to say, than, than any we've had in the past. It is hugely important that the UK government itself doesn't create the conditions where people feel annoyed enough uh, to take the view that actually they don't believe the UK is worth preserving. That is not something I'd want to see. Plaid Cymru leader Leanne Wood. Well, it's clear that Wales is so wealthy and so prosperous that the status quo is the only option for us, uh, isn't it? First Minister, in recent years, there have been a number of scandals concerning the quality of treatment of some patients in some wards in the Welsh NHS. How confident are you that the systems for identifying and correcting problems are now robust enough to prevent another Tawel Van or Princess of Wales style scandal? Oh, we're, we're confident the structures that are in place now uh, would avoid those uh, scenarios and are robust. First Minister, one area of hospital treatment where problems have regularly been identified is that of hospital nutrition and hydration. Yeah. Hospital nutrition is a basic health care need, I'm sure you'll agree with me on that. Now, yesterday, the Public Accounts Committee released another report on nutrition, and this is five years after the last report on nutrition. The report found, uh, and I quote, a story of a distinct lack of leadership stagnant activity and frustratingly slow progress in a number of important areas. You claim to have introduced new initiatives to fix this. Why have they not yet succeeded? And what reasons can you give for the slow progress on hospital nutrition? Well, of course, there's a formal process for responding to reports, but it's right to say uh, that nutrition and hydration is hugely important. The report did highlight good progress that had been made in, uh, in a number of areas. But of course, it's hugely important to, to have reports such as this in order to make sure that there is as much improvement as we'd all want to see. How many reports do we need, First Minister? The report highlighted that 9% of patients were not being given enough water to drink. There are other areas where progress is non-existent. No progress on a computerised catering information system. And that problem was identified back in 2011. Not a single health board has a named director with responsibility for nutrition. And not a single health board has achieved 100% compliance with nutritional care pathway training, despite it being mandatory since its introduction in 2011. What you hear from management is very different to what we as Assembly members hear from patients and our constituents. When can we expect to see some leadership from you on hospital nutrition? When will we get beyond apologies and claims of lessons learned to see that these simple basic problems in the NHS have to be prevented before they cause serious harm to some of our patients? Well, we've already introduced a range of initiatives aimed at patients, staff and visitors in relation to healthy uh, eating. We're considering ways to improve healthy food provision in hospitals even further, including an upcoming review of the mandatory uh, standards. And as I said earlier on, the statement by the PAC doesn't acknowledge the huge improvements already achieved by the NHS. The Auditor General, in his report, said that he recognised that NHS bodies have made good progress, implementing the recommendations made by both himself and by the committee, and that two-thirds of the recommendations were fully actioned, with ongoing work to address those recommendations not yet complete. So most have been done. Uh, some have not yet been done, but what is clear from, from what, what has been said by the Auditor General uh, is that uh, what is left to do is in the process of being done. Question three, Heaven. Question three, Heaven David. Will the First Minister provide an update on Welsh Government plans to create better jobs closer to home? Well, a cross-government team is taking forward the Better Jobs Closer to Home programme to better align a range of commercial projects with other, other interventions to support creation of meaningful employment in communities with high levels of joblessness. It was, it's worth remembering that it was in October 2015 that the Wales Trades Union Congress launched its excellent campaign for better jobs close to home to benefit Valley's communities, such as the one I represent in Caerphilly. And indeed, I received a very friendly note from them that last week uh, emphasising that, and I was pleased to see that the same principles contained in the programme for government. Um, I'd like to welcome the speech the Cabinet Secretary for Economy and Infrastructure um, made yesterday at Cal Colleague of Camoith, where he recognised the importance of addressing regional differences and taking a regional focus to creating resilient communities and indeed better jobs closer to home. With this in mind, will the First Minister provide more specifics um, about the Welsh Government's approach 
um, that will tackle those economic challenges faced by the Northern Valleys of South Wales, helping develop our own specialised sectors, building on existing strength and the social capital that exists there. Well, firstly, the commercial pilots are starting testing the interventions uh, to see uh, how they can be as effective as they can be. Uh, we're looking to implement uh, to a specific strategy, both regionally in the northern valleys and across the whole of Wales. There is a ministerial task force that has been set up cross-government in order to address some of these issues. The challenge for us is that there, is, there are differences within the valleys themselves in terms of performance. We know that Merthyr is doing particularly well in terms of attracting investment. That is not reflected in every valleys community. So what we're looking to do uh, is ensure that, that we can even out economic uh, development and improvement over the course of the next few years, rather than seeing some parts of the valleys do well and others less well. Commercial interventions, pilots, uh, pilot projects are part of that. The task force is another limb of that. Sean Gwenllian. Now, better jobs closer to home. Now, for my constituents, what that means is creating quality jobs in North West Wales. And the Welsh Government is duty bound to show the way in this regard and to have deliberate policies to ensure that government jobs are distributed across Wales. When then does your government intend to reform a job location strategy? We need to include specific new criteria which would lead to the distribution of Welsh government jobs in an equal way across Wales. Now, I would suggest that you do amend and reform this strategy as a matter of urgency before the people of North Wales lose all confidence in your government. I think that's totally unfair, bearing in mind that we as a government opened the Llandudno Junction office and we as a government had the office in Caernarfon and we as a government have moved more jobs out of Car Cardiff than ever under the Welsh office and have had jobs across the whole of Wales. It's not possible to have jobs in every location, but our record is extremely good, particularly in North Wales. There are more people working for Welsh Government in North Wales than was ever true under the old Welsh office. Um, First Minister, if we want to have more people working closer to home, then what about home workers? Uh, one of the problems that home workers face in my constituency and in other parts, particularly of North Wales, is poor broadband connectivity. We saw a report last week which said that some of the slowest speeds can be found uh, in North Wales, and there's still people who, many people who don't have access to superfast uh, broadband. What are you doing to hold BT and Openreach to account to make sure that they deliver on their promises and their obligations under the scheme, and what action are you taking to address those 5% or 4 or 5% of properties which are currently outside the scope of the scheme so that those people too in those areas can also have the opportunity to work from home? Yeah, as, as the member knows, we're looking to, for 96% of premises to have access to superfast broadband by the summer. Uh, they would never have had access many of those premises without government intervention because the market was never there. Right to point out, of course, the, the 4%, roughly, of people who wouldn't be part of Superfast Cymru, they are in particularly remote areas. There will be other uh, alternatives that have to be explored for them, such as, for example, the use of satellites uh, rather than uh, using the, the, the cables. These are issues we're aware of. We want to get, even though Superfast Cymru focuses on the 96%, the 4% are not forgotten about. David Rowlands. Yeah, uh, First Minister, I'm given to understand that there are at present 175 businesses on waiting lists for council-owned units in Caerphilly, some for up to five years. Can you therefore indicate, are there any government plans to help councils like Caerphilly construct new units to accommodate such uh, surpluses, uh, given the fact that obviously these companies have the potential to create uh, thousands of jobs close to home? Well, I'm, I'm not aware of the situation in, in Caerphilly as he describes it. I will write to him on that uh, because it, it's uh, specific to Caerphilly Council rather than to, uh, to Welsh Government. Uh, we need to avoid a situation where we build speculatively lots and lots of different factory units because we know a lot of them remain empty or they did remain empty uh, in, the, in the 90s. What we look to do is to identify existing buildings that are appropriate for businesses who want them and to look at where units can be built where we know there will be a demand. Uh, and that is something certainly that forms part of, part of our economic strategy. Question, Pedwar, Julie. Question for Julie Morgan. What progress has been made in setting up the Constitutional Convention? Well, the member will know I've been calling for a number of years for a Constitutional Convention to consider the future governments of the UK and the challenges posed by EU withdrawal makes the case for such a convention even stronger. Um, 
I thank the First Minister for that response and um, congratulate him for raising this issue, this very important issue, for so many um, years. Would he agree that the unwritten constitution of the UK is unsustainable in view of leaving the EU and with the threat of a second Scottish independence referendum? Well, the heart of the problem uh, as we leave the EU is parliamentary sovereignty and the idea that all power comes from one place in, in Westminster, uh, which has the ability to do whatever it wants. Uh, I, I don't think that's the right, right approach. I think there are several centres of democratic accountability, of which this Assembly is one. For me, the UK has to move more towards a system of shared sovereignty. It works in Canada. It doesn't create instability. Canada is one of the most prosperous and secure countries in the world. But we have to get away from this idea that somehow uh, everything is subordinate to Westminster and the UK Parliament in Westminster. That is not the model, I believe. It may work in the 19th century. It's not the model that's going to work in this century. Stefan Lewis. Yeah, well, I was disappointed uh, that the First Minister's response to developments last week was uh, what it sound like, sounded like calls for an internal constitutional convention for the Labour Party. But in moving forward, we know... Uh, that the Welsh Government Plaid Cymru White Paper on Europe has been rejected out of hand by the UK Government. We know that the UK Government's broken its promise to have a UK-wide approach to EU negotiations before triggering Article 50. This doesn't bode well for the much-awaited repeal bill and related legislation. But there is a clause in the Welsh Government Plaid Cymru White Paper, I suppose we could call it Article 132, which the First Minister could trigger, which would mean bringing to this Assembly a continuity bill now in, uh, in anticipation of the repeal bill to defend the current Welsh constitution from a power grab from Westminster? Well, first of all, there's been no formal response to the, uh, to the white paper that, uh, that we have produced. Uh, secondly, the Great Reform Bill, as it's termed, uh, is designed to be a bill that will uh, preserve, uh, we are told, preserve EU law in the uh, jurisdictions of the UK and in the laws of the different parts, different nations of the UK. If that's all it does, then it's sensible. However, what we would not accept, in fact, we would oppose this to the nail, is any suggestion that there will be a clawback of existing powers or that powers that return from Brussels should sit, even for a period of time, in Westminster. Uh, that is something we will guard against very strongly, and we will examine the Great Repeal Bill very closely to make sure that does not happen, and we will not support that uh, if, uh, if that is proposed as part of that bill. David Melding. Um, First Minister, I, I, I think the problem with the Constitutional Convention is you can't really have one until after a second referendum in Scotland, which at some point in the future does uh, uh, look a possibility. And I, I just wonder if uh, your more immediate aim should be with the Prime Minister to uh, see how the JMC system could be strengthened. And I commend Mr. Drakeford's uh, remarks on how that might happen, though not the style he made them. I think it was too caustic in Parliament when he compared the current process to St. Fagan's Community Council. But he did make some <laughs> interesting points about how the JMCs could be made more robust with agendas, a secretariat, and a clear purpose and future work plan. That's what you should be concentrating on. Over the next two years, uh, following the triggering of Article 50, there is a golden opportunity to restructure the way in which decisions are taken across the UK. It's no good waiting until that uh, period of time has elapsed, because then we find ourselves in a situation where there's no way uh, of, of, of putting in place an alternative system. What does that mean? It means that the JMC should evolve into a proper Council of Ministers, where joint decisions are taken where that is appropriate in areas that are devolved, may well be that there, there is merit in having uh, a general framework with regard to agriculture or indeed fisheries as long as it's agreed. We know that when the UK leaves the EU uh, there is the distinct possibility that state aids rules will no longer apply in which case we get a free-for-all inside the internal single market of the UK. I've mentioned that the, the term trade war I think that's perfectly possible there was a trade war between Ireland and the UK in the in the 1930s that's in no one's interest for that to happen. The alternative to that is to put together a set of rules in the UK, agreed by the four UK governments, and importantly, an independent adjudication body that polices those rules, a court. The ECJ performs that function in the European single market. The US Supreme Court performs that function uh, in terms of interstate commerce in the US. An internal single market with an agreed rules and a method of policing those rules is not a proper internal single market, and I want to see that internal single market work properly. Here we're Davis. 
Dear Clement, and personally, I very much welcome the the leadership that uh, the First Minister is showing on uh, this drive towards the Constitutional Convention. But further to David Meldon's important question, in the immediate here and now, and following that fascinating session we had yesterday where we had in the gallery law students from University of South Wales looking on, if we do not achieve that more parity of esteem amongst that you could see in a Council of Ministers and independent adjudication as well, what is your prognosis then going forward at this moment as we transition to exit in the European Union and to a very different framework within the UK? What's your prognosis if we do not get those mechanisms in place? Uh, there, there is a danger that the UK will start to unravel. Uh, in particular, one thing that, that is not often mentioned but I think is, is worth noting is what might, what might cause the rise of English nationalism. And people in England feeling aggrieved with the system, and I think you know, this this can all be avoided fairly easily. The distinct national identities of our four nations can be recognised, while at the same time recognising the common purpose that the UK uh, provides. But that does mean putting in place a, a structure that reflects the fact that this is a partnership of nations, rather than uh, believing that this is something like the unitary state that the UK was in 1972 before it entered what was then the uh, the common market. So these issues are, are resolvable, uh, no doubt about that in my mind. They need to be resolved so that when the UK leaves the EU, that structure is in place already uh, in terms of the, of, of the internal single market of the UK, in terms of the, uh, of the Council of Ministers, rather than doing it a few years after that and then leaving a vacuum. That's in no one's interest. Question pimp, Don. Question five, Don Bowden. Um, will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's strategy for tackling homelessness in Merthyr Tyfil and Rumney? Well, yes, I mentioned earlier on the, the legislation and what we're doing to monitor that legislation. We, of course, continue to work with all local authorities to ensure a greater consistency in the support to those who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Thank you, uh, First Minister. My, my, um, my concerns are similar to the ones that were raised by Jeremy Miles earlier on, but I want to focus on uh, one specific point. Uh, I, I, I had the, the opportunity during January, well, through to, 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 to just this week, of, of volunteering in the, uh, the winter night shelter in, uh, in Merthyr Tydfil uh, that was provided by the Council, and, uh, and I'd probably like to place on record now my thanks to Merthyr Tydfil Council for providing that night shelter and for the, uh, the, the selfless volunteers that have worked throughout the whole of that period to, um, to support the residents there. But I think what I was probably moved by more than anything else was the, the total hopelessness of people that find themselves homeless now. There were lots of people there using the shelter who'd find themselves uh, homeless for, for a number of reasons that you, that you alluded to um, earlier, earlier on, um, health problems and uh, drug dependency and so on. But I was also struck by the number that were there because of family breakdown and relationships. So they, they didn't have other issues, just literally nowhere else, nowhere else to, to, to live. Um, and, and it was the kind of downward spiral you do need that, to those come to a people, that those people yeah. face. Um, what I, what I, the, the question, uh, First Minister, came about as a discussion that I had with two relatively young men who decided that they could best lift themselves out of homelessness by joining together to, um, to, to get a place to rent. Um, they'd found a suitable oh, you place. You really do need to get I, to I, the, I your to, question. I, I need to explain. No, you've already situation. explained. You've already explained your explanation. Now get to your question, okay. please. They couldn't find a guarantor because they had no access to anybody that could guarantor their, guarantee uh, their, their, uh, their rental with the private landlord. So could you, First Minister, give some indication of what the Welsh Government can do, possibly working in conjunction with local authorities and housing providers, to break down the barriers which make it difficult for the homeless to secure rented accommodation um, and, and possibly look at... Can you please uh, answer the question, First Minister? The schemes. question has yeah. been asked. There are a number of issues that, 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 that my, my, my friend, the member from Merthyr and Romney, has, has identified. And that is, quite often, people cannot uh, get themselves out of the, the rut they find themselves in. Uh, they can't get a job because they haven't got an address. Uh, they can't look the part for a job because they haven't got any money. Uh, they find it difficult to, to access help for mental health problems or for uh, addiction problems. That, that there are pathways that people can follow that are provided by a, a number of third sector organisations, but getting people onto that pathway is often the, uh, the, the, difficult, uh, the difficult part. 
I suspect that uh, for many individuals, it's a tailor-made approach to that individual that will work uh, most, uh, most effectively. But of course, we also face a situation where people are homeless because they literally have nowhere to live and they can't claim housing benefit because of their age. Uh, and because of that, they find themselves uh, living on the streets as a result of that. And that is something that could have been prevented by the UK government. Mohamed Ashka. Heading officer, in October last year, the Conservative government announced £40 million programme to provide an innovative approach to tackling homelessness. This includes a number of initiatives to help individuals in danger of becoming homeless, to help rough sleepers to access employment and education opportunities, and to address underlying issues of long-term rough sleepers, such as poor mental health or substance abuse. Will the First Minister agree to consider the UK government's program to see what measures can be introduced to tackle homelessness in Merthyr Tidfil and other parts of New South East Wales? Well, I mean, firstly, there are lots of young people who are homeless because of the UK government and the decisions it took with regard to, uh, to supporting those who needed somewhere to live. They have nowhere else to live. They can't get housing benefit. They, can't, they find it difficult to get a job, so they end up living on the streets as a result of that. That money could have been better targeted, I suggest to the member, if it was used in that way. But the UK government is playing catch-up to us. Our Supporting People programme plays a very important part in preventing homelessness. We've protected that budget. We'll spend £124.4 million on that programme in 2017 to 18. We've also developed a number of distinct approaches to support those members of our community most at risk. For example, ex-service personnel, those who are ex-offenders, a pathway to try to help young people avoid homelessness because of uh, the actions of the UK government. So my, I, my, I would argue with it to him that actually the UK government is actually trying to catch up with what we're doing already. Question six, Mohammed. Question six, Mohammed Ashkar. Yes, Mr. Will the First Minister make a statement on Welsh Government financial support for employment in South East Wales, please? Yes, we continue to provide all forms of employment support to all areas of Wales. That includes our highly successful Jobs Growth Wales and Business Wales programmes, additional investment in apprenticeships, and of course, uh, not forgetting a range of other EU funded programmes. Thank you very much for the reply, Minister. The announcement by the News Quest that they pro propose to close their sub editing hub in Newport and to relocate to Weymouth has been raised in this chamber before. However, it has been revealed that the NewsQuest received £95,000 from the Welsh Government in 2012-13 under the Skill Growth Programme and further £245,000 to expand its sub-editing hub last year. Will the First Minister advise what conditions apply to these grants and what action will the Welsh Government take to safeguard this investment in supporting employment in Newport. In 2015, we provided £245,808 to the company towards the creation of 50 jobs and the safeguarding of 15 jobs at the facility in Mice Glass. Uh, that was exceeded, but the award was conditional on the jobs being in place until May 2020. Uh, if, those, if that condition is not met, then we will look to recoup the money. Question Scythe, who were Question seven, here we're Anka Davis. What's the government doing to promote good employment practices for workers involved in public sector safety supply chains in Wales? Well, a code of practice on ethical employment in supply chains was launched on the 9th of March. We expect the Welsh public sector to sign up to the code and to help improve the well-being of workers in our supply chain. I thank the First Minister for that answer. It was heartening to hear of the new code of practice for ethical employment. Uh, for supply chains in the Welsh public sector because it shows real leadership. But in, in launching the code of practice, the Cabinet Secretary said it's only by working together that we can help deliver a better and crucially a fairer deal for workers in our supply chains in Wales and throughout the world. So can I seek assurance from the First Minister that we will try to make this bite deeply in Wales through the long reach of the public sector and other agencies, third sector and others, but also using that reach deep into other nations, including developing nations, so that our supply chains, including those parts which rely on sourcing overseas, do not exploit, exploit any worker anywhere. Well, the Code demonstrates the Welsh Government's com commitment to the eradication of illegal and unethical practices that affect workers in Wales and beyond. Uh, we, we need to have the longest reach uh, possible and, of course, uh, to ensure that this uh, rolls through not just the public sector but private sector as well. So we will encourage businesses operating in Wales to sign up to the Code as well. That will raise and level the playing field for ethically responsible businesses so that those who employ staff legally and ethically cannot be undercut by those who don't. 
Finally, question eight to Caroline Jones. Uh, will the First Minister outline how the Welsh Government is supporting disabled people to remain active members of their community? Well, our framework for action on independent living sets out our plans to support disabled people in Wales to live independently in their communities. Uh, we will be uh, looking to review the framework this year, embracing, of course, the principles of the well-being of future generations. Thank you, First Minister, for that answer. Um, I have been dealing with a constituent whose wheelchair had to go in for repair. He was left without a suitable alternative, as this was a bespoke chair, for nearly for over two months, um, and has been unable to su uh, successfully contact anyone for updates. It was only after I contacted the Chief Executive of the Local Health Board uh, was any action taken. Um, frankly, this is unacceptable. I am told that waiting time for, for wheelchairs is excessive. Um, how can we possibly hope to support disabled people remain active members of their community if we can't provide for such basic needs? First Minister, what is your government doing to eliminate waiting time for wheelchairs and ensure timely repairs to this essential element of a disabled person's support? Well, it, it's clear that the uh, constituent who contacted you has... Uh, uh, it, it has gone through a really difficult experience. It, it needs to be investigated. Could I ask the member to, to write to me, and I will, of course, write back to her uh, to provide the, her constituent with, the, uh, with an explanation. Thank you, First Minister. The next item on our agenda is the...